faithfulness of our lives. May your word be shown. Amen. On Thursday evening at the Unified Board meeting, I started the devotion of the meeting by showing this image without the title. And I didn't give any background on it either. I just asked folks, what were their reactions? And I then went on to say, how do you feel when you look at this image? It was an interesting conversation. It wasn't quite what I expected. And one of the things that struck me was that for most folks, or some of the folks that were there, is that the first thing they wanted to do was fix it. For most, there was a sense of discomfort and challenge because it stretched assumptions, it stretched understandings, it stretched even theology. When the disciples notice that there is a man who has been blind from birth, they want to know why. Who sinned, this man or his parents? I mean, they're living under this, this cultural and religious assumption. You get what you deserve and you deserve what you get. Ancient assumption, isn't it? No one thinks that today. But here is this man who's blind from birth. So if he's blind from birth, he and he sinned, okay? He or his parents, they can't figure it out. It's the disciples, the ones that have been spending time with Jesus, who have been walking with him on his journey, who have an inside track on his message. I am the light of the world. And they're trying to figure out what that light means. Now this is one of the longest and most complex stories in the Gospel. I thought when Martin said get comfortable last week that uh, I said well wait till next week you're really going to have to get comfortable. I mean it is complex. There are seven scenes. It has seven structured scenes within it. And the structure using the narrative structure is an ancient pattern called chiasm. And so one in seven of the scenes are related to Jesus and his disciples, and then Jesus talking to the Pharisees at the end. Scenes two and six relate to Jesus and his encounter with the man born blind in early and late stages of the story's development. Or as we'll see, of his faith development. And scenes three and five relate to the early and late stages of the trial. So the community trying to figure out what this means. And so we have scene four in the middle. And so in the chiasm uh, structure, we know that everything points to scene four. And scene four is the interpretive key for the rest of the story. And scene four is about the family of the man born blind. They call the family. The episode with the parents presents an important focus to the story because it makes an explicit connection with the world of John's community. J.L. Martin has made the point that the period in which the believers were being cast out of the synagogue, as is mentioned here, could only have happened in the latter decades of the first century. Martin identifies the action as an official of the official expulsion from the synagogue with the period of around 80 to 85 of the Common Era, when the so-called Council of Jamia began to exert influence over the remnants of Judaism and centralized Jewish beliefs. So 
one of the things that we do know that as the, as the Christian community is forming and trying to figure out their identity, they see themselves as Jews. And they are, they are part of synagogue worship, and of things, but there is conflict that happens as they try to figure out their identity as followers of the way. The Jewish rebellion happens, and in 70, Roman, Rome comes down and obliterates Jerusalem and around as a response. And so the temple, all of their structures are gone, once again. And so the Pharisees and those who have survived, the leaders, have to try to make sense of how we are going to continue to be Jewish in this context, in the diaspora. And the Council of Jamia is one of them that sort of talks about how we become, how we save our identity and how we recreate ourselves. And synagogue worship becomes a very important piece, as well as missionary work. You often hear in Paul's, gospel, Paul's letters about the, the Jewish missionaries as well. And what happens, and even at Jeremiah, one of the things that was interesting is that one of the rules that they passed was that anyone who was confessed Christ were to be cursed. So this is a sense of being thrown out, it says being thrown out, they're thrown out of, the, out of the synagogue. They're thrown out of the religious identity that they have. And so, the community is trying to get sense of what this means. So thus, the story of the blind man presents a model for discipleship that reflects the story of the early church. In particular, the Johannian church. It was clearly a church in conflict. The church members began in Judaism and now were faced with the severe crisis of being cast out of the only church home they had ever known. How were they to understand their faith in this new circumstance? The healing of the blind man will be a story of bringing light to one in darkness. Yet, when the man receives light, he still must go through a pilgrimage of faith. Like other stories of the disciples in John, the process of true faith starts with the sign, but then must proceed to higher levels of understanding about the identity of Jesus before true faith is arrived at. And you will see this in the story if you go back and look at his responses. First, he's not sure quite who this guy is, and then he calls him a teacher, and then a prophet, and then a Messiah. There's that gradual understanding. It's very similar to the calling of the disciples of John 1 in the come and see motif of discipleship. And it happens in other places, but this one is out of conflict. It's out and in and through living with this conflict that he grows, that his faith grows. It's the conflict that spurs the growth. I mean, first it's his neighbors in scene two who don't recognize him and wondering what it is, and then there's the trial scene. And, and it doesn't seem that in this story that until he goes through these conflicts that he's actually able to go level of seeing, that other level of receiving the light. And it's then, and only then, that Jesus finds him again and, and talks to him, completes the sign or the healing. And the first step was simply to be there and do what Jesus said, and then it's that sense of being immersed in the community. I mean, the parents in C4, some commentaries say, is that they represent one of the factions in John's community. They are those who are the secret believers, but will not confess their belief publicly out of fear of being cast out of the synagogue. Such spent city is obviously not acceptable. Instead, the path of faith, path of faith, must inevitably conflict according to one commentator. The 
crisis point is when he's turned up, when he's expelled. And his faith journey has brought him to this point. It's the only force. He is now and only now ready to encounter Jesus once again, almost for the first time. And he's ready to confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, in the situation in John's gospel, of John's community, it's interesting. I mean, it's one model of faith. It requires an initial invitation and a response that is to be tested by conflict. And there needs to be leaps of faith all the way through to actually completely see in the light and to live into the light. But what does it have to do with our faith journey today? Well, for one thing, when you, you, know, you get what you deserve, you deserve what you get, in terms of that assumption, which is very much a part of our cultural assumptions, is something that Jesus rejects. He rejects that sense that it must be his parents that sin or something that he did. It's just something that happens. But there's also that sense of redefining how we see ability. Notice I didn't say disability. How we see ability. And sometimes it's okay to sit with the discomfort of that. So I want to return to the image. You wonder why the artist would name it disproportionate. And we see several ways how the cross is disproportionate. I wonder if you really look at it, what are the things in our lives that can become disproportionate or out of balance? What are the norms used to judge those times? And how do we recognize it when it happens? And how do we react or respond? Rhonda Svensson is the artist uh, who put this cross together and created this cross. It was in response to a national conference on spirituality and disability in Wellington, New Zealand in 2003. And she created this sculpture that she says explores location and dislocation. And through her paintings and poetry, Rhonda gives artistic expression to living with multiple disabilities. For her, it includes cerebral palsy and a specific uh, learning disability. And as a Christian, Swenson sees herself as whole, as complete in Christ. As a person living with disability, she recognizes that there are many ways of being whole. So the sculpture invites us to investigate our expectations and our assumptions about wholeness and how they need to be challenged. Art as a means to grapple with our abilities. Interesting. I thought that one way to sort of sit with that struggle a bit is to, to read some poetry. So indulge me. These two of them are written by Rhonda, and the second one is a hymn that we sing occasionally by John Bell. The first one is called Not Just Pew City. God there in the mess of uncertainty on the streets. Speaking in moments of silence, waiting, waiting for our response. To walk the road of unease and justice, the road that nobody wants to be seen on for fear of stigma attached. To speak when no one dares to speak, just watching life pass by, the clean, no hassle routine. And then, Cross. And we're going to sing after this beneath the cross of Jesus as well, but 
think of it in terms of this, the cross. A place to hang one feel, one's feelings, to sense your presence and care, even if you do not know what to do. You let me come into your life. The cross leaves its weight, a place to love, a silent spoken word, a gentle presence felt, just a place to be, to reflect the good and bad, and walk forward, to hold the cross of faith. And John Bell wrote this in 1984 in support of youth work in Glasgow, Scotland. Listen to his words. Jesus Christ is waiting, waiting in the streets. No one is his neighbor, all alone he eats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am lonely too. Make me friend or stranger fit to wait on you. Jesus Christ is raging, raging in the streets where injustice spirals and real hope retreats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I am angry too. In the kingdom's causes, let me rage with you. Jesus Christ is healing, healing in the streets, curing those who suffer, touching those he treats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I have pity too. Let me care, let my care be active, healing, just like you. Jesus Christ is dancing, dancing in the street. For each signs of hatred, he with love defeats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I 